Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting harvesting happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Alrighty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. This conversation was originally broadcast in January of 2019. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about the perfect mask, what hides behind the face of depression. My guest today is Dr. Margaret Rutherford. She is the author of Perfectly Hidden Depression, which will be released in the fall of 2019. Dr. Rutherford was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and began her career after graduating from Rhodes College in Memphis with a degree in French. After living abroad, she worked as a jingle singer, also performing jazz at night. Her career path transitioned upon earning a music therapy degree from SMU, leading her to a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Texas, and the rest is history. She's been practicing ever since. Welcome, Dr. Rutherford. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. I was busy back then. (laughs) You were busy. You're still busy in a different kind of way. I've laughed because from going from a jingle singer or a nightclub singer to a clinical psychologist, it only took me eight or nine years, but it definitely proves that you can do whatever you want to do. (laughs) Indeed. Let's talk about that dark side, you know, and I make it known to people who listen to the show and clients I work with that I'm a reformed depressed person. And so I'm always interested in visiting that dark side and destigmatizing what goes on under the human hood upstairs with our minds. Well, good for you. It's a worthy effort. It's one of the reasons why I started blogging in the first place was because I I run into this and especially in the South. We're just still behind other parts of the country as far as being more open about our vulnerabilities. And so when I began blogging, I certainly started talking about my own issues, a history of anorexia, anxiety disorder, and then I've had some personal chaos as well. <laughs> I talk <pretty laughs> I, openly about. <clears throat> I like how you say that, personal chaos. Yeah. It's very dignified, actually. Well, thank you very much. I am a doctor. Yes. <laughs> You don't just play one on a podcast. You That's you are right. a real one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about perfectionism, because I think that that is a, a skeleton that lives in many of our closets and under our beds and perhaps as our bedmates. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I certainly grew up being parented by a perfectionistic mother. And so I was surrounded by these, these kinds of signals, be they verbal or nonverbal, about what was expected of me. And she expected it of herself. It was just what she believed to be correct. And I have, as a therapist now for over 25 years, I have watched people walk in and sit on my sofa and they begin to, uh, when, when I ask some questions, They begin to tell me about things that have happened in their life. And Lisa, what I began noticing was that some of them did it with this huge smile on their face. They were totally detached from any kind of pain or emotion. And they they would discount whatever had happened to them, be it a rape or a a divorce or a, a sexual abuse of some kind or physical abuse in their childhood. And they'd say, you know, that was a long time ago. And 
you know, you asked me about it, so I told you. But and and I began wondering what is going on with these people that they are so detached. Um, frankly, as a therapist, you have to listen pretty carefully to people like this because if you just take your reaction to them from what they look like and what they appear to be, you really kind of think, well, nothing much is wrong. But underneath, there is this terrific self-loathing and shame and self-criticism and pressure to be to be um, very productive and and it's it I, I've developed this whole syndrome that these people present with that is uh, or live their life by that um, is very very rigid and non uh, non giving. You know when we talk about perfectionism and people who present well, you know. I, I'm sure I was one of those people at one time, you know, that sort of looked and operated in the world. And my guess is you were as well. Then when you start start to tease apart and see a little bit of cracks at the edges, you realize, well, yeah, it might look like it's all together, but oh my, there's some you know, percolation it, under there. <laughs> yes. Well, in fact, there can be intense percolation and to use your term and there's some wonderful researchers in Canada, Gordon Fleck, and oh, the, his other name is escaping me right now. But anyway, they are finding these connections and strong correlations between suicide and perfectionism. So we're really looking at a situation that's very, very troubling. I've had all kinds of parents contact me. I've had a, some reporters contact me about s teenage suicides or college suicides that the person looked wonderful. They had lots of friends. They were very successful. They were, they looked happy. And then all of a sudden they're jumped off a bridge or off a building or hung themselves or something. So it is a huge problem that I think we need to address very, very uh, carefully because we're going to miss these people. These people are going to fall through the therapeutic cracks, so to speak, of the system because it's because they don't look ill. They don't look sick. They don't look lonely, but they are ill and they are sick and they are lonely. Well, loneliness is an epidemic. I mean, I think if we were to talk about a social or cultural ill in today's climate, um, there are lots of lonely people out there that mm -hmm. mm, are suffering. Um, they're isolating. I mean, you can speak more to this probably than I. Do you know Jean? Uh, I'm going to mispronounce her last name. It's Twingy. Or it's yes, t yes. Her, her work is fascinating. And um, Igen, I, I, right? I, I she's been on I, the show before. I think it's Igen is her new book. Yes, yes, and I've read that book and her her research, you know, she's a sociologist for those of you listening who don't know her and she has studied generational change for for really she's studied several different generations and she sees the most change in this generation. And it's not a change in a positive direction. Well, she paints it that people are are not uh, this younger generation is not killing them each other more, but they are killing themselves more. They are, uh, their drinking has gone down, but, um, drug use has gone up. I mean, they're different, they're different directions it's going, but it's not in a great direction. Well, and if we look at the, I think it was the CDC just came out with a report recently that, um, our life expectancy, the average life expectancy of an American has gone down by one month as a result of 70,000 overdoses, overdose deaths and suicides in our country last year. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Suicide rates in all age groups except for 65 and over are going dramatically up. If I'm remembering correctly, it's men in their 40s, women in their 50s, and teenagers are actually increasing at the most alarming rate. Yeah. So, Margaret, let me ask you a couple of questions about how you suggest we start these conversations with our children, with our partners, with our coworkers, with our colleagues, with our friends. How do you out yourself, have the conversation? You know what? I'm not doing as well as I would like. I need help. 
that takes courage. Yes, it does. You know, one of my beefs, Lisa, is that whenever someone kills themselves, like Kate Spade and when Anthony Bourdain kill themselves, here came on all the morning talk shows the same question about what depression looks like, and it's going to look like this, 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 and this, and how parents can help their children. And they said, oh, you can look for these signs. And I thought to myself, I want to throw a pillow at the TV screen because I wanted to say, no, what parents need to do is talk about their own vulnerabilities to their children. They need to talk about when they're sad or when they get scared, they're not going to be good at something or when or some history they have of a problem. You model it. You teach that it's okay to have failures and weaknesses and be disappointed in yourself, or you can be angry, but you talk about it with your children and therefore they learn that they can do that. Um, That's really where it starts. You don't watch for signs of depression. I mean, of course you watch for signs of depression, but classic depression, but you also need to model this kind of openness with your kids. I think you make a really good point because of my history, my family history, their dad's history. Um, we, t- we talk about mental health in our house and we have very open conversations and my kids and their friends know that they can come here and sh- just be and, and talk. And I think it is that, that, that telling one's story, right. You know, right. that we need to unburden, we need to share what's going on. You know, when I when I again started the blog back in 2012 and I can remember the first post I did on my own panic disorder and I was there's still this part of me that thinks, okay, if I put this out on social media, will my phone stop ringing? No one will come to see me as a psychologist because, well, you know, she needs to heal herself. That's exactly the opposite of what has happened. People have written to me both for the podcast and for my blog post and said, you know, thank you for being real. It's ridiculous to think that just because you're a therapist, you don't have issues, you know, and and we we like that you're that you're talking about them. And so if anything, it has been very rewarding and warming to hear that from people. And, you know, I've so often, Lisa, I have a patient say, you know, none of my friends know I'm coming to therapy. And one of my basic response is, well, pick one and tell them. Yeah, Yeah, share. Tell them what's going on. And by far, people come back and say, you won't believe what I found out that, you know, she's on an antidepressant or her husband is or her children are or they're going to therapy or, you know, or she struggled with this as well. People just don't talk about it. It's as if it is something that we're just supposed to take for granted that everybody's mentally healthy and doing great. Well, no. Uh, in fact, you know, maybe some days we are, and but some days we're definitely not. And of course, if you have an actual mental illness, then you are trying to manage something that can be very difficult to do. Talking about your own panic disorder, you know, being yeah. able to speak your truth about that, I would imagine as a doctor, as a clinician who is taking care of people, took a lot of courage. Well, thank you. Yeah, I don't know how the quantity of it. I don't know if you know about the organization. This is my brave. Jennifer Marshall is doing great work with that organization. And it's people coming and on stage and either reading a poem they've written or talking about their story or a song. But somehow they reveal their their mental illness. And we had one here in northwest Arkansas, and I decided to to uh, to perform, to do it. And it was amazing to me because I thought it would be a breeze. I thought, oh, well, now you've been writing about this for so many years. It won't be anything. Well, in my particular piece, I also was talking about how you would know if you saw me that I was anxious, that I hold, I'm holding onto the chair or I'm, you know, I'm doing different things. You know, I sit down suddenly. Um, and I tell you, Lisa, it was amazing to me and very humbling to realize that when I got up in front of an audience of people to say those things, you know, I had panic. No, (laughs) come on. uh, Yeah. (laughs) uh, Yeah. Because it was, it was just, 
I was I was being even more vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even just talking about having panic. I was saying, and this is how you know I have it. Um, and so, you know, that drive to hide, that need to hide can be so prevalent. And yet the more of us that come forward, I mean, I, I, I you know, I have people as, as patients who are wonderful, wonderful people. And um, when they tell me that no one knows about whatever they're struggling with, I just, I just, you know, I understand that it's a privacy issue um, and respect that at the same time as a culture, the more we talk about it, the more we will understand and then help each other um, make good decisions about our mental health. Amen to that. Let's jump off for the break now. To learn more, please visit www.drmargaretrutherford.com. On Facebook, she's at Dr. Margaret Rutherford. And the book we're talking about today, which will be released in 2019, is Perfectly Hidden Depression. Here comes the break. We'll be right back. Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for nutritious helpings of positive goodness. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and at times we all need a little support. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and at the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com to explore experiential online and on-site optimal lifestyle management consulting services, including recovery fortification and life crisis triage. And we're back continuing the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Margaret Rutherford. We're talking about the perfect mask, what hides behind the face of depression. Let's return to that conversation. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, we are dancing in the dark by outing and destigmatizing mental health challenges. My guest today is Dr. Margaret Rutherford, and we're talking about her book, Perfectly Hidden Depression. So, Margaret, before the break, you were sharing a little bit about your own story and getting up at This Is My Brain, an event that took place in in your neck of the woods in Arkansas, and um, talking about how you would know if you were having a panic attack and the panic that you experienced sharing that. Oh, yeah. I, I Tears came to my eyes, and the audience was was wonderful. They they got, they got kind of quiet because they could see how emotional I was. And then they, you know, like I'm getting emotional thinking about it. They called from the audience, come on, you can do it. Yeah. It was just so sweet. And I, you know, I did, I was fine. Uh, and the other people on the panel were also, I mean, I was very moved by many of much of what they had to say. Um, there was a guy that has bipolar disorder there and he put his family through hell and <laughs> yeah and they yeah <laughs> and they were and they were there and he turned to them in a very vulnerable open wonderful way and just said i know i did and i'm so sorry you know it was be- way before he could accept himself what was going on with him so you know, we, we have to remember that that it is hard to love someone sometimes with mental illness. Um, and um, it, be, just because we we want them to be better. And unfortunately, you know, much of that journey is an individual one. So we can support as much as we can. But we sometimes um, watch our loved ones become pretty self-destructive and then you know, we're there to help pick them up and dust them off, but they have to want to do that. Let's talk about perfectionism as being highly overrated as well as uh, normalcy. Yes. Well, perfectionism, again, it's not a bad thing in and of itself, um, but it's the kind of perfectionism I'm talking about in the book is, is one where it's taken way beyond the pale. Um, it is not only you know, the, these are the kind of people that when they put something on their plate, nothing else comes off. Um, and so their plates get more crowded and more crowded and more crowded. Um, the syndrome that I've come up with had has 10 different characteristics. And um, again, a syndrome is sort of like codependency. It's a it's a group of behaviors that tend to stick together. Um, and you find them when you find one, you tend to find them all. Um 
or at least most of them, um, things like these are people who count their blessings um, and without realizing that it's okay to talk about some of the more negative things that are part of um, our daily experience. And they take a lot of responsibility. They have lots of friends, really sincere friends. They're very sincere givers, but at the same time, no one really knows them. They don't talk about themselves. So that kind of perfectionism can be very, very dangerous. Well, it's, you know, weaponizing uh, con- control on a, on a certain level, right? If I know everything about you and I'm always there for you, but never have to reveal anything about myself, that keeps me armored up, walled off and safe in my mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I have these people who have come to see me because of my writing or talking about it. And I don't mean to sound dramatic, but one girl, when she left therapy, looked at me and she said, my mom and I have talked and we know that I wouldn't be alive if I hadn't come into therapy. So uh, she was about to marry somebody that she it was abuse, abusive to her, but it looked like the perfect relationship. And so she was extremely unhappy in it. And the only way she could think of escaping was suicide. So wow, when she began unveiling and taking down that wall that you mentioned brick by brick by brick, then she could see that there were other options for her, you know, a lot of other options. Wait, let's just stop for one second and just like tell anybody that it may be listening to this. Suicide is not really a good option. Right. I mean, we don't really, we we never really say that in the course of our conversation when we're having um, interviews and talks like this, you know, it's not a good idea. Well, you know, you can't, take it back. You will deny the impact on people that you love. You know, the, I believe I was talking to Michael Yapko, who's an international expert on depression. He's, I was talking to him about the book and I've been to several of his seminars and he was kind enough to talk with me. And he reminded me that the three reasons why people commit suicide mostly are hopelessness, impulsivity, and they feel like, or they feel like, the, you know, their family would be better off without them. So, um, uh, anyway, it, those kinds of distortions in your own mind and feeling that, you know, uh, that hopeless, um, I know I've, I talk with people all the time who feel suicidal and, and yet they look back on it and think, oh my gosh, I could feel better. I just didn't think I could at that moment. You know, you can't. The, the other thing I think it's important to talk about is, is having the idea, you know, there are times in, in many people's lives, myself included, where I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired, you know, like, it's mm-hmm. like if, if it were over, it'd be all right. It's not mm-hmm. that I'm looking to do it. Right. Well, no. And so a lot of people have that, Lisa, for sure. I think probably if some of the people that have been, that have struggled with suicidal suicidality with me were here to talk about it with us, they would remind us very quickly that depression can get so dark and so despairing that it does seem like uh, a a choice that makes sense um, because that is just so hard to bear. Um, And, and, I, I understand that and respect that and honor that. That is not what you and I are saying, I think. It's no, just no, no. Simply, it's just simply to say, you know, it is especially the part where you think you, your family or whomever would be better off without you. That is not how. That's an and, irrational belief. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And when we are in those states, we're not in our rational mind, that we're chemically altered you know, even if it's our own chemistry working against us, right? But we're not in our right mind. Right, right. That's right. So um, it's it's so important to look at all these different things that can lead to someone seriously considering that choice. Um, And I'm always feeling, I always feel much better when I ask somebody, well, how does it feel for you to have that thought? And they look at me and they say, it scares me. That's the answer I want to hear that it scares them because when they start not getting scared about it, then that's when I worry. Yeah. And the thought is just the thought. I mean, I think here's the other thing when when we're talking about 
mental illness and mental health, right? The self-care and, right. and, 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 and um, optimal lifestyle required to manage um, mental health. I mean, I know for myself that that is the secret sauce. You know, am I sleeping well? Am I exercising well? Am I eating well? Am I, am I having good connected social um, engagement? You know, those are part of the mental health plan. Of course. In fact, I remember learning in graduate school, the question you always ask someone when they say that they're struggling with suicide, suicidal thoughts, you say, you know, who's your support system? Yeah. And if they look at you and say no one, then that's a problem because our support systems, people who love us and who we love will keep us fighting and will keep us um, engaged with life. Um, And that's hard to do when you're, when you're significantly depressed. Yeah. And, um, you know, in managing depression, and this is hard for many people who are doing so now that may be listening to this, the doing, the action becomes so challenging. And, and that's when it's really helpful to, um, have an accountability partner, you know, whether it is a, a friend, um, Therapy, of course, is essential, but maybe you're not there yet. Maybe getting yourself to a therapist is an absolute monumental task. Yes. And of course, what do you have to overcome? You have to overcome uh, trust issues or fear or uh, just feeling like you're lame because you, you know, you you quote unquote need a therapist. Um, And yet a model of therapy that I love to talk about, Lisa, is that when you really think about uh, what we admire in leaders, we want our leaders to be people who turn to other people for their advice. Yeah. We have a president with a cabinet. We have, you know, we, we well, have. Wait a sec. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Sorry. <laughs> well, we hope that leaders are asking the advice of people that um, that have different opinions than they do or have a different perspective on life so or on that particular subject, whatever it is. And so I like to think about therapy as as almost like a consultant, a therapist acting as a consultant. It just so happens that the topic happens to be the self. You know, your thinking, your emotions, your experience, any trauma in your life, that's the topic. But, you know, after after years of experience or just schooling or whatever, an education interest, then, you know, therapists are people who are who spend hours of their weeks uh, engaged in talking about that and trying to help people make the changes they want to make. I love what you just said about being a consultant, you know, that, that our, that our mental health professionals, our therapists, our consultants who are there to guide us, um, to self-improvement. Yeah. Well, that's certainly my model. I mean, I, I know that there are plenty of other, uh, you know, theories and, and certainly the relationship itself is very important. Often, sometimes, you know, Sometimes a therapist is the only person you've ever met that would keep a confidence or or not make fun of you if you laughed. I mean, if you cried or whatever. So, you know, sometimes that relationship and is is vital because it's it can be one where you think you you either grow for the first time or you regrow a sense of trust. Ah, repair and reparenting. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> so um, I'm not saying that the relationship, but because making you know, calling it a consultant almost sounds a little objective. But at the same time, I think, especially for men, I think that that way of talking about it and describing it would be more palatable for a lot of men who tend to. Um, I did a study three or four years ago now, um, and just seeing about the gender differences and why women might not go to therapy and why men might not go and definitely men. And this is no big whoop. I mean, it was no big surprise for men. It was their stoicism that they should be able to, you know, solve the problems themselves. And women's was more the um, fear of what other people would think. We are out of time. Oh my gosh. This snuck up, this snuck up on me, which means we'll have to hang out more together. That's all. 
Okay. That it's sounds a, great. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, actually. <laughs> and I hope our listeners feel the same way about what you shared, because the more we talk about it, the more we normalize the conversation about mental health and the more we're able to you know, express that V word, right? That vulnerability with one another, the more we see we're not separated and isolated, that we're, we're, we're all in this human process together. You bet. You the, bet. The book we've been talking about today, which will have a fall 2019 release, is Perfectly Hidden Depression. My guest today has been Dr. Margaret Rutherford. And to learn more about Dr. Rutherford's work, please visit drmargaretrutherford.com. And on Facebook, you can find her at Dr. Margaret Rutherford. And thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining me on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Margaret Rutherford, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.